The concept of a memory seems pretty intuitive to us. It is the ability to store information about particular experiences and reconstruct them at later times through memory retrieval. But where and how is this information stored inside the brain on a physical level? In this video, we are going to explore the idea of an engram, a fundamental unit of physical memory substrate as well as biological and computational principles that govern memory formation and linkage. If you're interested, stay tuned. The study of memory can be traced back to early 20th century, when a German biologist Richard Semon coined the term engram, referring to lost in physical changes in the brain that occur after learning or experience. He envisioned that once formed, the engram, whatever it is, becomes dormant and can be awakened by similar experiences or parts of the original event. This reactivation is what we experience as memory recall. But notice that the original phrasing in Salmon's definition is very vague. It doesn't really tell us anything about the biological nature of these lost in changes. As decades passed, it became known that the brain consists of nerve cells that generate pulses of electricity encoding incoming stimuli. So memories must be stored as changes in patterns of how neurons talk to each other. But before we dive deeper into what these changes are, let's discuss how we can study memory formation in the first place. To address what happens in the brain during memory encoding, we need two crucial pieces, a proper behavioral task and the means of experimentally monitoring the changes that occur in the brain. It is only when you are working with human subjects you can explicitly ask them if they remember something or not. But looking at the level of single cells is only possible with model organisms, such as rodents, and they for sure can't tell you the contents of what they remember. To overcome this problem, we can use a clever experimental design. One of the most popular setups is called a fear conditioning paradigm. There are many different variations, but the main idea is that memory is defined as forming an association between the two stimuli. A neutral stimulus, also referred to as a conditional one, for example a sound tone or a spatial context, and an aversive stimulus or unconditional for example, a mild food shock. During training, the sound cue and the shock are presented either simultaneously or with a short delay, and the animal learns to associate previously neutral stimulus with pain. The effects of such conditioning are usually tested on the next day, when the mouse is presented with the same conditional stimulus. If the mouse freezes in response to it, and freezing is a type of a defense mechanism, it means that the associative memory was successfully formed. Since the animal could retrieve that, this sound leads to pain. Here I've used the sound cue as an example of conditional stimulus, but it is also possible to pair the foot shock with almost any type of sensation, such as the particular spatial context or a smell. Great, now we just need to find a way to experimentally see the memory formation. Now. Because this is a biologically complex process, there are a lot of changes that occur in nerve cells, from DNA modifications to the synthesis of new receptors. Just like any cells, neurons contain DNA, a genetic set of instructions of what proteins to make and how to make them. It turns out that there is a very special class of genes called immediate early genes that rapidly and selectively get activated in neurons that undergo plastic changes during learning. These genes, the two most common ones being FOS and ARC, do a whole lot of different things on a molecular level regulating the amount of neurotransmitter receptors and inducing synaptic plasticity, the details of which is not fully understood. But for our purposes, you can think of these genes as markers for memory encoding, triggering the downstream cascade of learning-related changes. But gene expression on itself is not something that we can easily observe and measure. The idea is to functionally link the activation of these immediate early genes to some kind of reporter process that could be addressed with our experimental toolbox. For example, 
it is possible to inject cells with a harmless virus that could genetically modify the neurons by spreading pieces of DNA containing a gene that encodes a fluorescent protein. These DNA fragments also bear a special region called a promoter that basically controls whether the gene for the fluorescent protein is turned on or off. Importantly, this promoter region is identical to the promoter of the FOSS gene, controlling its expression in the intact cells. As a result, the production of this protein and the expression of the FOSS gene become closely coupled. So whenever the FOSS gene turns on to carry out its learning-related changes, the gene for the fluorescent protein also activates, and we can visually see the neurons responsible for memory encoding because they are glowing under the microscope. Pretty cool, right? But there is a very big problem with the simple configuration I've just described. Namely, it is impossible to carry out the fear conditioning right after the surgery, since the animals have to recover and the virus needs to spread around, which can take up to several weeks. But because it is impossible to tell when exactly the modification kicks in, by the time you put an animal into the experimental apparatus, it may have already formed a multitude of other memories, for example, while sitting in its home cage. So, under the microscope, you'd see many glowing neurons marked for immediate early genes, and it would be impossible to tell which of them correspond to the associative memory we are interested in. So, ideally, we need to be able to control the timing of this tagging process and transiently turn it on for the duration of the experiment to isolate the engram for its single memory. There exists a handful of approaches which I'm not going to describe in detail, but on a high level, it is possible to engineer this genetic machinery to lie dormant and activate only upon the presence or absence of a certain chemical compound. So an overall simplified setup might look like this. At first, we have a transgenic mouse with inactive memory tagging system, so none of its neurons are glowing. To perform a fear conditioning task, we take the mouse, put it into the training environment, administer the drug to turn on the tagging system, and pair the foot shock to a sound. Inside the brain, when this particular memory is formed, some of the neurons undergo modifications controlled by the FOSS gene to encode this experience, causing a subset of neurons involved in the memory encoding to express fluorescent proteins. The effect of the drug quickly wears off, so although the mouse certainly forms new memories as it's chilling in the home cage afterwards, no new neurons are being tagged with the fluorescent proteins. So we can now look under the microscope and see the newly formed engram. Depending on additional genetic modifications, it is possible to interrogate these memory coding neurons to uncover the properties of the memory trace the so-called tag-and-manipulate approach, as we'll see shortly. One of the first things that is compelling to test is what happens to these engram neurons during memory recall. Remember that according to Salmon's visionary definition, engram can be reactivated by stimuli similar to the original experience. Indeed, during the recall of this memory on the test day, the same pool of engram cells become activated. But does the activation of these neurons actually cause the memory to be relived? Or is their activation merely a byproduct of recall? Well, it turns out that if you selectively suppress their activity during test trial, or even kill those tagged neurons, the mouse won't show any signs of freezing when presented with the conditional stimulus. Importantly, this disruption affects only the trained fear conditioning memory, and mice don't show any deficit in the recall of other memories. And suppressing the same number of random neurons that are not tagged as engram cells doesn't affect the recall of the trained memory, and will still freeze in response to the sound as before. All of this indicates that the activation of these specific neurons is necessary for memory recall, so they are indeed responsible for storing that particular piece of information. And if you selectively activate them in the absence of the conditional stimulus, the mouse will freeze, even though it's not presented with anything associated with the shock. 
So the activation of engram neurons is not only necessary, it is also sufficient to induce a memory recall. Notably, similar results were obtained in other memory paradigms, when mice learned to associate conditional stimuli with rewards rather than pain, suggesting that these principles of engram reactivation are not unique to fearful memories. Let's take a closer look at how engrams are formed in the first place. The experience can generally activate a large number of neurons, and there may be some background internal patterns of activity on top of that. Yet only a small proportion of these active neurons end up chosen to become a part of the engram. So what determines which cells get to encode the memory? Is there some sort of selection process? If so, can we experimentally intervene with it to control which neurons become allocated to the engram? Short answer to both of these questions is yes. But let's first make a few observations. Consider the amygdala, an emotional center of the brain, which has been shown to play a key role in such fear conditioning tasks. Although the majority of amygdala neurons receive necessary sensory input and respond to both the food shock and the tone, only between 10 and 20% of them become allocated to a given engram. And just in comparison, in the dentate gyrus, a region of the hippocampus, this number is much lower, between 2 and 6 percent. In other words, engrams are sparse, and this sparsity differs across brain regions. Perhaps a more exciting and counterintuitive observation is that within one brain area, the sparsity is highly conserved across different memories. For example, changing the strength of the stimulus in the conditioning task and even changing the memory content for example, from fear to reward, doesn't affect the engram size. It's compelling to think that more vivid memories after a stronger shock would have larger engrams with more neurons encoding for it, but that's just not the case. This suggests that there must be some internal mechanisms that keep the engram sparsity constant, controlling the proportion of neurons that become allocated to storing each memory. But why is that? Well, there is a great amount of evidence that the brain implements a sparse distributed system for information coding and computations. These representations with non-overlapping codes seem to be optimal, having higher storage capacity and robustness to noise. So the sparsity of the engram is a defining characteristic that must be kept within reasonable bounds. One particular mechanism that ensures the constant engram size is the competition through neuronal excitability. Let's unpack what this means. As you probably know, neurons are electrically excitable cells. To send bits of information, they generate brief pulses of electricity, called action potentials, or spikes. Spikes are born when the voltage on the neuron's membrane crosses a certain threshold. The intrinsic excitability of neurons refers to their inherent ability to change membrane voltage and generate action potentials in response to various stimuli. It is like the readiness of a neuron to fire and transmit information. Imagine you have different cars, each representing a neuron. The acceleration of a car represents the excitability of a neuron, which determines how quickly it responds to stimuli. Car A has low acceleration, meaning it takes a lot of effort on the gas pedal to make it move faster. Similarly, a neuron with low excitability requires a strong and sustained input to generate an action potential. Car B has high acceleration. It quickly responds to even a light touch on the gas pedal, rapidly increasing its speed. Similarly, a neuron with high intrinsic excitability can generate action potentials readily even with the weak input. It turns out that from this pool of all eligible neurons, the ones with elevated excitability have a higher probability of being recruited into a memory trace. This presents opportunities to control the very process of memory allocation experimentally, since it is relatively simple to alter the excitability of neurons. For example, it is possible to genetically modify the cells with special ion channels that would open when you shine colored light on them and let positive ions in, bringing the voltage closer to the threshold and thus 
making the neuron more excitable. Indeed, if in this configuration we turn on the light to excite a certain sparse population of neurons during training, then later same population of neurons would be activated during memory recall. And just like before, it is possible to selectively activate them in the absence of sensory context to trigger freezing or inhibit their activity, blocking this particular memory. In such allocate and manipulate approaches, we can control where exactly memory gets stored. But let's get back to the concept of intrinsic excitability for a second. More excitable neurons seem to indeed get preferably recruited to the memory trace. But what are the mechanisms of such competition? Apparently, this gating is carried out by local microcircuitry with the help of inhibitory neurons. Consider the circuit where the principal neurons, the ones that compete for the memory, are also connected to interneurons that locally inhibit other neighboring principal neurons, the potential competitors. This ensures that the small pool of most excitable cells essentially indirectly suppress their neighbors. There is indeed some experimental data supporting this view. For example, it has been shown that blocking inhibitory interneurons results in increased engram size. Okay, great. So far we have only looked at the engrams formed in one particular region of the brain, the lateral amygdala. Similar studies were conducted with other brain regions, observing separate engrams for fearful memories in hippocampus and cortical areas. But there remains very little understanding of how these memory traces throughout the brain actually interact with each other. Are they separate memories or just small components of a larger distributed engram? The paper published last year in Nature Communications sought to answer this question. They employed a novel technique called tissue clearing, essentially making the neural tissue transparent, which allowed them to image neurons in the entire brain. Using similar approaches to tag neurons with active plasticity genes and later activate or inhibit them, the authors discovered that a single fear memory elicited an engram that was distributed across a wide range of brain regions from areas that were known to hold memories such as the hippocampus and amygdala to a few surprising regions, including thalamus, hypothalamus and even the brainstem. This supports the idea of a so-called engram complex, that memories are not localized in one specific region. Instead, they are distributed across sparse ensembles of neurons scattered throughout the brain. This has led to the idea that different brain regions are likely to encode specific aspects of the full memory. For example, part of the engram in amygdala holds information about emotional valence. Hippocampus is responsible for the spatial context, and the cortex might encode the particular sensory experience of the foot shock. Up until this point, we have only talked about a single memory in isolation, which is only one piece of a puzzle. Because the brain has to utilize stored information, memories need to somehow be connected to each other in order to be later unified into something like an abstract concept or a principle. So the question is, how can different memories be linked? The important thing to realize is that the very existence of a link between two memories is also a piece of new, behaviorally relevant information, kind of a memory of itself. And because it needs to be stored somewhere, this information about the connection between the two memories also should have some sort of physical manifestation inside the brain. So how can the brain not only store the contents of individual memories, but also links between them? Well, a very elegant solution is to encode the connection between memories as the degree of overlap between the populations of engram neurons. Let's see what this means. Remember, we talked about how neuronal excitability controls the process of memory allocation, so that more excitable cells are more likely to become recruited to an engram. But the excitability of a given neuron is not set in stone. Instead, it constantly waxes and wanes throughout the lifetime of a cell. These time windows of elevated excitability last several hours before the cell's excitability goes down. 
If you think about it, it makes perfect sense. Otherwise, if the excitability levels of all the neurons were fixed, the same small pool of cells would win the memory competition over and over again, mixing memories together and drastically decreasing information storage capacity. For instance, consider the experiment with two different memories being associations between foot shock and two different sound tones. When the two corresponding fear conditioning sessions occur closely in time, with less than six hours in between, neurons that were most excitable during the allocation of the first memory, several hours later still retain their elevated levels of excitability, and a large portion of them can outcompete the rest of the population during the allocation of this second experience. As a result, engrams for the two events become overlapping and functionally linked. This means that if you try to extinguish one memory, for example by presenting sound A without the shock, so that the mouse gradually dissociates them and stops freezing in response to the tone A, it will also affect the other memory, and the mouse will show decreased levels of freezing in response to the tone B as well. You can see how the paired memories got extinguished together. In contrast, if during training the fear conditioning sessions are separated by 24 hours instead of 6, populations recruited to the two engrams are mostly non-overlapping, and it is possible to extinguish one memory without affecting the other. This demonstrates that the larger the overlap between the populations of engram neurons, the stronger the link between memories, so that thinking of one experience automatically makes you think of the other. Notice that in this example, the link is established only during the initial memory allocation, when the overlapping pool of neurons is recruited. But this offers very limited capabilities, because the two events may not seem related at the time of the memory formation, and the link may become apparent only later, once the dots are connected, so to speak. It turns out that memories can also be linked by core retrieval, when the two engrams, that are initially non-overlapping, become repeatedly reactivated together. For instance, researchers trained mice on two different tasks, taste aversion, where the animals learned to associate saccharin with the feeling of sickness, and fear conditioning paradigm, pairing sound to the food shock. Essentially, the two memories, saccharin equals bad and sound equals shock, were formed independently with four days between them, resulting in two non-overlapping engrams. After this, animals were repeatedly presented with the two conditional stimuli, saccharin and sound, simultaneously, thus reactivating the two engrams together. As a result, Mice started to freeze when they tasted saccharin, which normally shouldn't happen. Analysis of the neural populations revealed a greater overlap of engrams after such simultaneous retrievals. This core retrieval reorganizes memory traces and generates an assemble of neurons that are shared by both engrams. Intuitively, it means that if some external cue repeatedly reactivates two engrams simultaneously, it is advantageous to physically couple those memory traces inside the brain, so that the next time retrieval of only one of them would lead to a recall of the other. Interestingly, this shared pool of neurons that emerges as a result of the core retrieval is not essential for storing individual memories. If you selectively silence these neurons, fear conditioning and taste aversion memories in isolation are recalled properly. However, after silencing, saccharin fails to induce freezing. This means that the emerging overlapping memory trace holds information about the link between the two memories, rather than the content of them. Alright, let's try to tie everything together. In this video, we have seen how information about experiences is encoded as synaptic changes in sparse arrays of neurons, known as memory traces or engrams. The sparsity of engrams is highly conserved and is kept at optimal values through a kind of a competition where most excitable cells 
are preferably chosen to be recruited to the memory trace. Activation of these chosen neurons is both necessary and sufficient for memory recall, and by manipulating the activity of these cells, we can evoke memories, delete them, and even create a new memory in the absence of experience. Engrams are believed to be scattered throughout the brain, encoding different aspects of each experience like pieces of a puzzle. And multiple engrams can further become linked by sharing some of their neurons. This linkage, applied to a multitude of different individual memories, is likely to underlie abstraction and general principles of learning. Understanding the intricate workings of engrams is crucial not only for unraveling the mysteries of memory, but also for unlocking the potential of our own cognitive abilities. This is where our today's sponsor, Brilliant.org, comes into play. Brilliant is an innovative educational platform that can help you advance in STEM fields in a fun and engaging way, with an emphasis on active learning. Their courses contain a wide range of problem-solving exercises and beautiful interactive visualizations. So, instead of simply memorizing facts, you get to develop a deep understanding of the concepts and apply them in real-world situations. And the courses are fully self-paced, so you can learn in bite-sized chunks just by dedicating 15 minutes a day. Brilliant offers over 80 courses, covering a variety of topics in math, physics, computer science, and more. Whether you're a student, a professional, or just someone who loves to learn, they have something for everyone. For example, if you enjoyed this video, you may be interested in Brilliant's newly released course on algorithms and data structures, which explores how memory is organized and allocated inside computers. Don't miss out on this opportunity and take your learning to the next level. Go to brilliant.org slash Artem Kersanov to get a 30-day free trial of everything Brilliant has to offer. And the first 200 people to use this link will get 20% off the premium membership. If you enjoyed this video, press the like button, share it with your friends and colleagues, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and consider supporting me on Patreon to suggest video topics and enjoy the bonus content. Stay tuned for more interesting topics coming up. Goodbye, and thank you for the interest in the brain.